Chapter 266 Ajax, POV I spent a few more minutes talking to the three Guardian assassins to find out as much as I can about this incident and anything I can about future incidents that may happen. We are actually expecting them to happen a few more times in the next month or two now that the first attempt has been made, the assassin says. Even with them being captured? I asked, surprised. It's because of this quick reaction, the assassin says as he shakes his head. Unfortunately, the information that you have, Enigma, has already been leaked. How? I questioned him, despite, Enigma, not being something that I was invested in keeping secrets there were very few people that knew it was the specific privacy skill I had. It's because of an achievement, the assassin's answers. The achievement is called Poor Detective, the requirements are for your first 20 uses of the inspection skill to be on different people and for all of them to be resisted. The achievement makes it so if your attempt to inspect is resisted you know the exact skill that blocked you. I felt my face scrunch up at that, annoyed that I didn't have a chance to pick up that achievement simply because the information was restricted. It's a lot harder to get than you think, the assassin says. When unlocking a skill, the action usually has a massive success increase, not only that but receiving it is almost dependent on success. Those who have the achievement are extremely inclined towards the skill, but they unlock its use against someone with a privacy skill that is like yours or a high-ranked epic. Not only that, but they then have to resist the urge to use the skill until they have it resisted by 20 people. Most people who get the achievement got their inspect skill before the age of 10 and even then they received a common version like, inspection, they are then trained for low-level spy work, a second assassin says. Every nation has a few of them, but they never go deep undercover, with you walking in public it was only a matter of time until one of them was sent. If they know I have, Enigma, why would they be trying more often now? I stick back to the main point. How high is your level in, Enigma? The third assassin asks, I must have had quite the glare, as he quickly followed up. Don't answer, just think about it, this guy has two epic skills in the high 30s or low 40s, even with them working together, they still couldn't break past your skill fully. This is the only chance they have before you get too many levels in it. When he put it like that it did make a good point, they all had a small window that was closing quickly. Not only that, but our reaction to the attempt has been seen so now they will know there is something to hide, another adds on. Going forward, you will still have at least two of us shadowing you, but we will also get one of the squad leaders to stay close in case we need to call them and one of them says. I thank them for the intervention one more time before I continue making my way home. Despite this little distraction there is still a lot for me to do today, not only that, but this interaction also added another entry to my to-do list, I have to look into how I can get, empowering restriction, the skill sounds just too versatile to not pick up. As I walk, I try to ignore the dull ache that has spread throughout my body, it is specifically focused on my right arm and isn't anything more than a mild annoyance, but it clearly marks another point for improvement. I need to do something about my vulnerability to extreme mana discharges. Using more than a third of your mana in a single moment is not something realistic for most mages, but my style is perfectly built for exactly those kinds of power bursts. Mana channels work very much like other muscles, and it's clear that despite the constant pressure I put on them with my fighting style, there is little in the way of heavy exertion. The altercation earlier also has my guard up as I travel the last hundred feet towards the gates of my mansion. I am keeping track of everyone who is following me, and am glad to see that one of the three assassins didn't leave with the prisoners, but instead, continued to shadow me. How was the delve, my father asks me as he sees me enter the compound. It was fine, we stuck to the second floor of the gold mine, so there was no danger for me. I answer. Did you find anything for me to use? He asks as he wipes the sweat from his brow. I chuckle at that, it seems obvious that I wasn't the only one to throw myself into my crafting over the summer. With my mother taking up such a big role in coordinating my sister's and grandparents' merchant enterprises dad focused on his, blacksmithing, unlike his time back in the village, he now had much more challenging work and metals that he could use so his skills started improving much quicker. It was a jungle biome. I say and I can see the disappointment spread across his face. See if you can make anything useful out of this. 
His expression changes as I toss a good chunk of snake skin at his feet. The snake could have it camouflage with the surroundings, see if you can get it to retain that aspect while turning it into a piece of armor. It's still early enough in the day that my father is the only one who is home, mom, Judy, Alana, my grandparents, even Tom and Kate are all still out working. It's the perfect time for me to get started on my trials with magnetic mana. As I enter the alchemy lab that I have set up in the mansion I find a nice pile of different metals all set up to one side, this is all you're getting, don't come asking for more for at least a month, Judy's handwritten note sits on the top of the pile. I smile as I toss the note and start setting up my first trials. One thing I am extremely wary of is the presence of mana. I already know how it can mess with the laws of physics, so I have to take that into account at every step of the process. I had initially thought I would try to run some of my own spell generated current through the metal to see if it would generate the magnetic effect, but the arrow for earlier put that plan on the back burner. It was times like these in my new life that made me appreciate some of the things I had considered useless or a waste of time back in my old life. More than anything however, it turned out that some obscure college classes turned out a lot more useful as I still remembered a few interesting facts. This world was both rather advanced yet medieval at the same time compared to Earth, the presence of mana greatly hindering yet at the same time driving innovation meant I didn't have easy access to an outlet to simply plug in for electricity. I quickly started creating small discs made from silver and zinc I had so I could create my own battery. The small tower of salty water soaked cloth and metal discs should produce a low of stable current that I can then run through the metals to see if they produce any magnetic field, and more importantly magnetic mana. My first experiment proved to be both a success and a failure at the same time. While the homemade batter worked well enough to power the magnetic piece of metal and did in fact cause a small magnetic field to appear there was no change in the mana that I could notice. At the very least it seems that the small amount of mana in the atmosphere didn't prevent the electromagnet from forming it wasn't enough to generate any mana. My second test was to swap out the regular piece of metal connected to the battery and replace it with one that was mana-infused. The change was immediately obvious as the power of the magnetic field increased, sadly the nature of the mana in the metal didn't change one bit. Creating a batter from mana-infused metals, I replaced my original battery and used a normal bit of metal. The power of the magnetic field increased this time as well, but that was because the amount of current generated was much higher. Despite my lessons telling me that the current produced by these sort of batteries was supposed to be low this one even produced a few sparks in the circuit. When I replaced the piece of metal with a mana-infused metal, however, I finally felt a serious change with my, sense mana, both the battery and the piece of metal were slowly being drained of their mana and a new mana type was being emitted out from the metal. Not only that but the power of the electromagnet grew again, to the point that I had to intercept the rest of my samples just so they wouldn't get drawn in from across the table. It was a success. Chapter 267 Ajax's first success was short-lived, the moment he could feel the new type of mana being produced, he quickly disconnected the circuit. A quick reorganizational break followed where he secured that nothing will actually be drawn in by the magnet this time around he reconnected the circuit and started to focus heavily on his, sense mana. The first thing Ajax noticed was that magnetic mana had a much fainter presence in his senses. It wasn't quite as light as the space mana he felt coming off Anna's companion, but it was a middle ground between it and other mana. The second thing Ajax picked up was that the mana-infused metals were quickly running through their mana as more magnetic mana was released into the air, where it would break down into ambient mana. While this might not seem like that big a deal Ajax did notice that the amount of ambient mana generated by the magnetic mana breakdown was 10 to 20 times higher than the amount that the metals were losing. As the mana kept dropping lower and lower Ajax, could feel that the rate of transfer wasn't being affected in the slightest. While with a regular batter, you would have a slow drop-off in output as the charge was getting lower the circuit formed by the mana was maintaining it at a constant speed. This maintained transfer of current started to form cracks throughout the metal piece that became a magnet. As it turned out, it was the small metallic tower that made up the battery that ran out of mana first, and that is where things took a big turn away from regular earth-based physics. Despite the absence of new incoming mana current still flowed through the circuit, if at a lower speed. 
the lack of magnetic mana being produced caused the metal sample to explode. The power of the explosion wasn't all that great, the shockwave generated didn't throw away the broken chunks off metal at great speed, though it did knock the rest of the circuit including the batter off the table, it was what came next that brought with it a lot of potential. Ajax's, sense mana, felt something that felt akin to a small black hole that formed in the place where the magnet had been and it was sucking up all of the ambient mana it could. Worse yet Ajax could feel the suction force take hold of his own personal mana, it wasn't powerful enough to actually drain him in any way, but that extra pressure exacerbated his already stressed mana channels and increased the dull pain to a searing sting. The whole process took no more than two seconds and Ajax silently cursed as he had been distracted by the increased pain. On the table, however Ajax could see a small bit of metal inside the small creator the initial explosion produced. The original sample had been the size of his pointer finger, what was left was barely the size of his fingernail, despite that this remaining piece had twice as much mana infused in it than the full-sized original piece. As Ajax picked up the small new piece carefully, he could sense the instability in the structure, whereas before it had been a well-produced ingot this nest piece would break further into pieces even from a light tap with his hammer. Despite the lack of immediately useful outcomes Ajax knew that with a bit of research into the topic, this could lead to some very big discoveries in blacksmithing, so much so that once he got a bit more of a handle on things Ajax planned to pass off the entire project to his father to focus on. Ajax's time with Balthazar showed once more as the first thing he did after examining what remained from the aftermath of the experiment was to quickly grab a piece of parchment and start to scribble down what he had observed in as much detail as possible. Once he got to the portion on the formation of the new metal Ajax paused for several minutes where he vented by cursing the entire lineage going back a few thousand years for the stupid spies that forced him to damage his mana channels earlier in the day. As he finished writing down a full accounting of the experiment Ajax felt a little lost on what to continue with. He had gotten a good long look at magnetic mana, but unlike any of his previous instances of picking up a new mana type, this one was simply being generated instead of actively channeled and used in a spell, even his epic affinities had been picked up as he discovered them while channeling spells from their component or related affinities, and not from simply observing them get created and break down. To make matters worse Ajax wasn't yet willing to try and channel any more mana for the day without a good reason so he decided to simply call it a day for now. The setup for all of the experiments had taken a couple of hours already, and it was just about dinner time, he could pick all of this back up tomorrow after his mana channels had a chance to recover. Underscore 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 King Grinder POV So the first attempt took place? I ask one of my trusted shadows. It did your majesty, the shadow confirmed. And he let us interrogate them even after they got something from him? I am pleasantly surprised at this turn of events, first he willingly revealed his second legendary skill, and now this, even if it was all information we had it went a long way to showing we had built back some of the trust the nobles and less sis had torn down. He did, while they didn't bring much new information on the baron we did manage to gather quite a bit about some other matters, the shadow confirmed. Wait, there was something new on the Baron, that was interesting, is this his way of sharing something else with me, was it something that he had just overlooked? What was it that you found out? Comparing his stats from our original information, there is a disparity that is hard to account for, the shadow continued. It seems there are six stat points that can't be justified. Let me see that. I say and take a side-by-side -side comparison of Ajax's stats from the time he came to the academy, and first unlocked, Enigma, to now. He leveled three times, I am not seeing any disparity. None of our reports show him as having used any stat potions since that time, this despite him receiving some after the tournament, the shadow says. 
It seems odd that he would use potions only on the stats he gained from leveling. That was a good point, this was also something that could have slipped Ajax's mind, or maybe he had discovered a way to push his stat points further even after he spent his free points, did he only give us the first half of the method? Make a full report of this discrepancy and have it brought to me, after that do a thorough clearing of any other records mentioning this, furthermore nobody is to look into this any further. This could very well be a test from him to see if we will hound him for answers, even if it isn't he has more than earned a bit of trust from our side as well, and he will share when he is ready or not, that is all there is to it. What other information were you able to retrieve? We got the identities of seven more spies that made up their unit, the shadow says. Sadly they were all working for the Empire. Damn. The Empire's view on human supremacy means that their spies will never make contact with those of any other nation, at least for those working inside our borders, those working even further out will work with some of ours at times, but that means the information train will stop with this. We also managed to discover that the tomes on curses that were used in the previous outbreaks were brought over from the Empire, the Shadow says. Apparently they were part of a bigger plot to smuggle them into the Republic in hopes that a resurgence of curse users would break the fragile peace and restart the war. We were truly unfortunate that the nobles who intercepted the illegal transport started using them here instead of destroying them or turning them over. I smothered down a wave of frustration that rises at that piece of information. Thank you for your report, dismissed. I dismiss the shadow and go back to thinking of the other request that was made of me. How Steelblade has managed to buy three of the fifteen slots for the lesser of the Empire's dungeon in the deal with the Goldmancers, but they want my help with putting pressure in getting young Benedict one of the few coveted spots in their main dungeon. The problem is that doing so will remove the only person in the group that outlevels Ajax and that will strip away the already weak information protection that he will have while delving at that time. To do so, after I already asked Ajax to hold back in the hopes that no information will be leaked will be quite the backtracking. Chapter 268 Goldmancer, POV The news of the altercation that happened earlier today is being suppressed from all sides, the royals don't want to risk an incident that will gain them nothing, Ajax is being his usual reclusive self, despite the fact that he could use attack to gain some concessions, and the Empire is trying to get as far away from the whole thing as possible. It's a good thing I had one of our own people follow the kid and just report on what happens. A pleasure to see you again, Ambassador. I greet the man visiting my mansion. Despite the warmness in my voice we both know that all of it is more for show and because it is expected of me. If you'll join me. We both enter one of the secure and warded meeting rooms that are dotted around the estate, it is almost spartan with the expectation of two plain-looking if extremely comfortable chairs. The other expectation of course being the two representatives of the royal families that are here to monitor the exchange. Are you any closer to lowering those ridiculous demands of yours? he asks. I can feel as his skills try to influence me, bargaining is a lot harsher than the empire. It mostly stems from the fact that they are surrounded on all sides except from one by untamed wilds where monsters ruled. This gives them a more plentiful access to higher level monsters, but it also makes their merchants a lot gruffer from dealing with the frontier scavengers as the vultures are called. I was actually leaning that way when I woke up this morning, this isn't a lie, as I really had been willing to lower my requests on the terms he deemed as ridiculous, but I was also planning on asking for a lot in return by increasing the demands he thought weren't ridiculous, just excessive. However, I'm sad to say that things have changed since then. I'm sure they have, he harumphed, good, that reaction means he doesn't have any skill that is able to detect lies strong enough to get my measure, his response wouldn't have come like this otherwise let's get on with it. I have to admit I do admire their sense of expediency, unlike most merchants in this kingdom who gained their starting fortunes from birth, the phrase time is money rings doubly true in the empire. There is the small matter of today's altercation, to consider. I say. I feel myself pressured as both representatives lock their eyes on me, and I feel the pressure of their skills push down on me. They do so, for only a moment, before they stop the pressure long enough to take each other's measure, notice they are in agreement before redoubling their efforts on me. Unfortunately, enough for them whatever skills they have do nothing but alert me of their attention, 
all of the pressure is easily washed away by, golden opportunity, the first epic skill I gained and the only epic skill I have to surpass the second bottleneck and surpass level 100. Your men have tried to steal away the secrets of beekeeping without paying for them by going directly to the source, that is categorically against the spirit of this negotiation. I exclaim in outrage. The king has already informed me of the information he managed to get from the spies who targeted Ajax, not only that but one of them even happens to report directly to the ducal family I am trading with. The information didn't come for free of course as the king traded it in exchange for some extra weight put on gaining some more cover for Ajax's delve if at all possible. Or are you saying that isn't why you targeted Baron Hearthbound? I ask and feel my trap snap into place. Despite their political skills I can clearly see the confusion that spreads across all three of the people in the room. All of them know that what happened earlier today had nothing to do with bees, not only that, but they also know that I know it too. My only regret here is that I can't have Anna with me in this meeting, so she can learn from this. It takes no more than a moment for the confusion to develop into something else, here however is where they each go down their own path. The crown's representatives look quickly turns to glee as his skill stops working on me, and he turns to enjoy the look on the ambassador's face. The empire's representative frowns, but also turns to put more pressure on the ambassador whose face shows dread at what he knows is coming. It would be all too easy for him to deny that this is the reason they target Ajax, but by doing so he would risk a full-blown political incident, not only that, but he would effectively be forced to blame the empire's ruling family for the attempt. So what are your new terms, he says with a sigh of defeat. In consideration for your earlier request I am willing to lower my end of the bargain to 20% of the honey harvested for the first 10 years. I say as I feel a greedy grin cross my face as I turn towards the royal representatives. All I ask in return is that the delve inside your main dungeon come with an included booster to clear the final floor. This was one of the few times that people would willingly let someone above level 120 enter the dungeon, so long as the contracts were well written, he wouldn't be allowed to attempt to delve past whatever floor the highest booze tie could successfully reach on his own. It would also fully unleash Ajax to delve as far as he wants without exposing anything to the Empire. The ambassador's look of defeat morphs into one of joy as not only had my demands of his house lessened, but the Empire was taking the full brunt of the cost for my concession. That is unacceptable, the representative's voice slices through the offer. I can't fight the frown that works its way on my face, golden opportunity, is still telling me I have a perfect deal that I can finalize here yet I can't seem to see one. While the Empire is willing to compromise given the situation, the terms for the delve into our main dungeon are considered fixed, the representative continues. I find it most troubling as the finality of the statement doesn't just not weaken the feeling coming from, golden opportunity, but it in fact makes it even stronger. There has to be something I am missing, an angle that not only lets me get what the king wants, but now something that would also let me profit much more. I feel as time slows down as my other epic skills take effect, I know that this last offer from the crown is the key to figuring out the golden deal that is on the table. It's time to break it down and analyze everything that I can gain from it. Firstly it is clear that the empire is very interested in Ajax, that doesn't seem at all surprising considering their human supremacy rhetoric and the importance that Ajax would have in showing humanity's superiority. This also means that his other statement is also ironclad, the rules for this delve won't change since they need them in place to evaluate Ajax. Secondly, the representative said that the empire as a whole is willing to compromise, this means that they see this deal going through as a national objective, surely it isn't the taxes on the honey that has drawn them in so this once more comes around to Ajax. No, not only that, but also into seeing if they can get any insight into King Grinder's plans and schemes. The third and subtle part that comes across is the clear bribe offered to me specifically, trying to get me to use my newfound leverage in order to gain something for myself. A tempting offer, certainly one King Grinder wouldn't mind me taking seeing as his request is clearly beyond reach now. The thing that stops me is the simple question, would Ajax also see it that way? If he finds out I used the leverage of his ambush for my own family when he had already facilitated this deal. While I hope he would be open-minded enough to do, so, he was also very young and unpredictable. 
I feel all my skills fizzle out and time resumes its normal pace as an idea strikes me. Not only that, but I can feel, golden opportunity, gain a level and I know I have the perfect answer. What if I were to add another rule, to the ones regarding the first delve, without changing any already in place? I ask, a glint of greed must be shining in my eyes but I simply can't help it, the return on this deal is way too good, not only that, but the empire won't be able to help themselves and they will have to take it. And what do you have in mind, the representative asks. What if I request that the same team that delves the dungeon gets to do a second delve twenty years down the line? I offer a chance not only to observe Ajax now, but also compare it to twenty years down the line, they can't pass this up. It's acceptable, the representative says, though his tone sounds a lot more like the words are it's a deal. Chapter 269 Ajax wakes up the following morning almost as tired as he was when he went to sleep, despite going to bed relatively early and sleeping in, he still feels like his body is moving underwater as he gets out of bed. A quick look at his mana and the 1780-2510 tells him everything he needs to know. Taking a small amount of mana Ajax quickly brings up a small flame on the top of his fingers, he sighs in relief as he feels the mana smoothly pass through his channels without causing any pain or discomfort. It seems like it may have taken most of the night for his body to recover and his mana reserves haven't had time to fill back up yet. You look dreadful. Hatchet says as Ajax sits down at the breakfast table. Ow. Oh. Hatchet throws Luna an offended look as he moves to massage the leg she just kicked. Is this to do with what happened yesterday? Luna asks as she ignores her ex-teammate and focuses on Ajax. Can I help? It's from yesterday. Ajax confirms, and that has his mother drop the papers she was looking at and focused on him protectively. But there is nothing you can do, the problem is already fixed. And it was self-inflicted, he then quietly murmurs, but everyone at the table hears him clearly. What did you do to yourself? His brother asks him. I overtaxed my mana channels. Ajax says, and both Kate and Luna freeze for a moment, before looking at him more, intensely. How much mana did you put in one spell? Kate asked. And how quickly did you channel it? Luna follows up, without giving him time to answer. About one thousand, in, a quarter of a second. Ajax says slowly as he thinks back to the fight. What was the most you ever used in one spell before that? While Luna seemed more hesitant to ask, as this was very personal information, Kate had no such filter, and she was very concerned with the well-being of her extended family. 400. Ajax responded, and Kate let out a sigh of relief. In about one second. Both Luna and Kate wince a little at the massive drop-off in time frame. Okay, Kate says as her eyes unfocus, and she starts thinking up the correct treatment. Your channel should have repaired themselves with a good night's rest, but they are still fragile. For the next week, don't exceed the 400 in one second. Healers are the most prone to mana channel damage. Luna fills in. Lack of exact knowledge need for improvisation, and the sometimes instant application required means that we are often overloading spells with mana, so we try and train our mana channels to support such efforts. If you want I can work with you and set up a training schedule to safely increase your limits. Kate offers. But only after your week of rest. Ajax is quick to agree, happy that he has someone he can trust leading him down a known path instead of having to make it up along as he goes. Speaking of making things up as he goes, Ajax quickly finishes his food and with a polite, if rushed, farewell he makes for his alchemy lab. Without any strain on his mana channels Ajax quickly goes through the exact same experiments as yesterday, the only difference today is that he is able to pay much more attention to the mana emitted. Upon the electromagnet shattering Ajax now has a clear feel for the mana generated, much to his surprise at the moment of the shattering the shockwave is actually formed by a sudden release of void mana. The small remaining piece of metal sucks up all the mana in its surrounding and turns it into two other types, one of them is pure space mana, and the second is of a type he does not recognize. These revelations are all useful, first and foremost because he now has a source to exemplify void mana should it ever come out that he has a new element, and secondly he has a source of space mana that he can observe independent of the whims of Anna's bond. 
Despite all this Ajax clearly recognizes that space is a much too complex mana type, it clearly deserves its legendary rating and Ajax is forced to accept that the cost to truly study it by recreating the phenomenon is simply too exorbitant for now. This doesn't discourage him however, as he focuses on his initial task of attaining magnetic mana. He now has a good feel for the mana, despite not having seen it be used in a spell, he focuses on channeling it himself. The channel is two seconds long and Ajax only uses 200 mana for it, easily staying within the parameters set by Kate. Much to his surprise nothing happens as his mana gathers, at the end of the channel it simply changes into magnetic mana and Ajax quickly finds himself pelted by every single piece of metal that wasn't tied down inside the lab. A few things become clear following his first trial with magnetic mana, the first is that he gathers every piece of metal and makes sure it is secured he doesn't want a repeat of the ineffective firing squad. Secondly, for the first time ever Ajax had used a mana type without possessing the skill for its affinity. Is this what it's like to cast without having a skill for the affinity? Ajax thinks aloud as he replays the trial in his mind. No wonder chanted spells have all their intent transmitted during the chant itself and that runic spells have it preset by the runes. Trials 2 and 3 don't work any better. In fact Ajax can't see any improvement compared to his first attempt. He had thankfully reduced the mana used to 100 in each, but this clearly wasn't working. If I can't copy it outright, what if I can recreate it piece by piece? Ajax mumbles as he brings out the metal samples once more. Despite magnetic mana clearly only being a rare mana type it was oddly enough created by two epic mana types, lightning and metal. Not only that, but Ajax had access to both. Ajax quickly recreated the circuit but this time intentionally didn't use a mana-infused metal to act as the electromagnet, instead he gently infused his own metal affinity and felt it interact with the natural electric mana. Despite the magnetic mana still being produced Ajax could feel that the process wasn't exactly the same, this was extremely obvious when the metal didn't shatter once he withdrew his metal mana. His next task was to recreate the other half of the fusion, using a mana-infused piece of metal Ajax skipped the improvised battery completely and powered the circuit by directly generating lightning mana. Unlike the first trial, this one proved much trickier, whereas before all that mattered was that he provided mana, doing the battery half of the equation meant that he needed to maintain a steady and stable current in order for the experiment to be of any use. It took up 300 of his mana before he managed to get a handle on it, but Ajax also noticed the biggest difference between the experiment when it used his mana and when it didn't. The biggest difference was clearly the lack of explosion, but a more subtle one was that when his mana took up one half of the creation process the mana released in the surroundings was barely a fifth of what mana-infused metals could output. Having gotten consistent results with both half Ajax then moved on to both providing the current and infusing regular metal with his metal attuned mana at the same time. This did result in some magnetic mana being generated, but the amount was pitiful, barely a fifteenth of what the mana infused metals produced, though in hindsight this did make some sense, he was actually surprised at how high his efficiency was. Once he got a handle at generating the magnetic mana through the intermediary the next step was to generate the mana without the help of the circuit. Much like when he experimented and gained his ice and magma affinities Ajax mixed his metal and lightning mana directly. This direct fusion finally resulted in a source of magnetic mana that Ajax could actively mold, with a quick movement he brought out his shield and carefully infused the combination into it after all what could be more useful than a shield that actively drew your opponent's weapon to it. The initial augmentation was clearly inefficient, despite this Ajax kept going and tried to increase the power of the magnet only to then lower it in a controlled manner. His mana had run dry in ten minutes and Ajax all but collapsed onto a chair, heaving out breaths of exhaustion. Despite all this a victorious smirk was etched on his face as his eyes unfocused at locked onto the text present in his status screen, Magnetic Aspect Mana. Chapter 270 Ajax started working with Magnetic Mana the next day, the only reason he didn't start sooner was because he had run his mana dry getting it. That night he had gotten some very much needed rest after how tired he had been that morning. In the following days Ajax started to get a very clear understanding of why magnetic mana was only rare, 
Not only that, but he was glad that this was only a stepping stone as he tried to approach gravity, and in the future attraction and repulsion. He had been a little disappointed when he didn't receive a trailblazer achievement for gaining the skill, but he had held little hope of doing so considering that there had to be a metal elemental out there that had managed to obtain it before him. Once he obtained the skill for magnetic mana affinity, his ability to manipulate magnetic mana started to mirror what he was able to with all of his other rare mana types when they were first obtained. The problem with magnetic mana was one that all fire users also dealt with, while they may be able to control the fire, not only in terms of direction and power, but also intensity they were unable to exert any control over the heat that fire released. Much like his experiment Ajax was capable of creating magnetic mana by simply molding his own mana into it, but magnetic mana would very quickly despect and simply break down into the ambient mana. This could be countered by increasing the amount generated, but that presented a whole different issue. His biggest challenge with magnetic mana was that Ajax was unable to affect the magnetic field it generated. This was immediately obvious as he saw his own weapons stick together the moment he tried to augment one of them with a powerful enough magnetic mana. By the same token trying to use magnetic mana with a strong enough field anywhere close to him would cause all the metal pieces in his armor to get dragged towards the source as well. These initial results had almost resulted in Ajax excluding magnetic mana from his melee fighting repertoire, if not for an obvious interaction he had initially overlooked. While simply creating one magnet that was close to him was clearly not going to work without massive amounts of training, creating two magnets was something else entirely. Magnets had the same attraction properties towards all metals around them, but they had a more complex relationship towards other magnets that entered their magnetic field. Namely they could work together and attract each other or they could repel each other. It took a few tries, but Ajax found that with the use of mana, he could create magnets that had no south and north pole, but were entirely made up of one pole. The only issue with this approach was that right now it took Ajax almost 10 seconds to change the pole alignment of his mana, this was currently far too long to be useful in combat, but he hoped that the time would get lower as he got more experienced and the skill level grew. Unlike the application in melee combat, magnetic mana did have an immediately useful application for his ranged combat. Much like his massively overcharged electric arrow from a few days prior firing an overcharged magnet could prove highly beneficial. Sure the arrow was all but guaranteed to hit armor, making precision strikes all but impossible sticking two heavily plated knights together with one arrow was something he could see himself doing. Loath as he did to admit it Ajax had been forced to concede that magnetic mana would most likely become highly popular should he spread his existence. The reason for this was fairly obvious, it gave mages, who traditionally wear little to no metal on their combat gear, a great way to deal with physical fighters that managed to close the distance. The practicality that a powerful magnetic bolt didn't actually have to hit the target to knock them off balance and pin them to ground with their own armor would raise its popularity even higher among combat mages. There was only one issue with this line of thinking. Despite having generated the mana type and successfully copying it Ajax had no idea what rune would signify magnetic mana let alone any chanted spells with it. Determined not to get too focused on his new mana type Ajax had picked up his usual training after a few days and just slotted magnetic mana as another mana type to regularly practice. Not only that, but Ajax was paying very close attention using his, sense mana, to see if he couldn't find a way to achieve gravity mana. What the fuck was that? Theron cursed as he felt his axe swing, going off course. I felt it too, Bobby said as the two stopped sparing. Is this what you meant when you said you wanted to try something out? Donnie asked Ajax as the three plate wearers were called out to help him with his training. Yes. Ajax confirmed. What was that? Nellie was obviously the most shocked person there. Unlike the others, Nellie had a well-developed, sense mana, skill, she was not only able to follow Ajax's invisible projectile, but she also noticed that it only affected the metal armor they were all wearing she herself had felt a decent tug on her buckles as the bolt left Ajax's hand. It felt like a weird wind spell, Bobby said. I could feel my swing being pushed to one side. It wasn't all that powerful and it definitely didn't have the slicing power that wind spells usually come with. That wasn't a wind spell. 
Theron said, unlike Bobby, who used a sword, Theron had gotten a much better idea of what happened from his axe as it had a wooden handle. It's like it only messed with my axe head. It did a lot more than that. Nelly turned to them once she noticed Ajax's wasn't going to answer her question just yet. It might have been too faint for you to notice in the moment, but it also affected your armor, there was just too little mana in the bolt for it to have a large effect. How do you mean? Jackson asked, also curious about the development. I'm not sure what spell that was, but he basically launched a ball of mana that had no color, it was invisible to the eye I could only track it with, sense mana. Nelly explained. That ball seemed to suck all metal towards it, not only that, but the closer the metal got to it the harder it pulled on it. It almost knocked me off my feet, just by pulling on my buckles, when he launched it. It didn't feel that strong. Bobby said. The bolt went over your heads. Nelly said. Not only that, but it seemed to get weaker, the further it traveled. Not quite. Ajax finally decided to answer. It has nothing to do with distance, the mana just breaks down once it is released, so it gets weaker. Stepping into the dual area Ajax grabbed a wooden hammer off one of the training racks before he squared off against Donnie, who was also in full gear. You sure it's a good idea, Ajax? Donnie asked, unlike his brother Donnie, had his large shield and small sword. I'll be fine, just fight to the first clean strike. Ajax said. The mismatch in the fight was obvious, if Ajax was to use his, mana siphon, Donnie would be the one at a disadvantage, but without it he had Ajax beat in terms of both strength and dexterity not to mention endurance. As both fighters charged Ajax quickly started to channel his mana, unlike his previous 50 mana bolt Ajax was putting a whole 200 mana into this next one, not only that, but he was also increasing the output at the expense of longevity. Right as they were about to enter striking distance Ajax launched the bolt right at Donnie's feet. The large fighter had been around mana long enough to get a feel for the projectile that Ajax launched, but was utterly confused when he saw it wasn't aimed at him. That confusion cleared up very quickly as he felt himself topple forward as his shield and armor were sucked towards the mana. Unlike the previous bolt, this one stopped a few inches off the ground right in front of him. By the time he had regained his balance, he had already dropped to one knee. The horrible stop to his charge wasn't the worst of his problems however, with all the extra weight he couldn't even bring up his shield in time and Ajax got a clean open shot as the wooden hammer rattled his head inside the metal helmet. Despite the seriousness of the situation everyone had a hard time not laughing as mere moments after the spar ended Donnie launched himself from a kneeling position a good few inches off the ground and onto his ass once when the force pulling him down abruptly disappeared. That is one hell of a trick. Jones said. Yeah, Ajax nodded. Too bad, I can't use it when I have anything made of metal on me. You should look into getting some weapons made of bones or claws, just on the off chance. Jackson suggested giving Ajax a lot to think about. Chapter 271 Jones's suggestion was something Ajax hadn't thought about, not because he forgot, but because of the financial impracticality of the idea. Sure monster parts were known to have an extreme value when it came to crafting, their high mana density was renowned, the only issues with the idea was that they were only useful as a partial ingredient. With extreme mana affinities they made for a great addition to potions, alloy mixes, and especially mana conduits. Using only monster parts however was not only extremely expensive but also seen as wasteful, from the tooth or claw used to fashion a single sword you could have made at least five superior swords so long as you mixed them with a metal of equal quality. It was this knowledge however that convinced Ajax that he should in fact be actively sharing his discovery of magnetic mana. Sure, he had no way for other casters to use it directly as he didn't know any chant or rune, but that was hardly a hard limit. More than that Ajax was actually hoping that word of his magnetic mana would spread. Unlike all his other types of magic, magnetic mana was harmless by itself, sure it could immobilize an opponent, but that was also the extent of what it could do. A really obvious counter to this would be a very strong defense that wouldn't care if someone was immobilized. After all its limited offensive uses, were as likely to spread as the extremely high mana cost that came with using it like this. 
All of this would culminate with the reveal of his secrete mana type being easily countered by strong armor. While the idea was good, in reality anyone attempting this tactic against him would run head first into his actual hidden ace, Void Mana. Void would simply ignore all of the armor and let him dispatch people with relative ease. By the time the first day of the next cycle came around Ajax had practiced teaching his magnetic mana to Nelly. Unlike with Void, Ajax might not be able to formulate a chant or a rune with magnetic mana, but he did know how to create it artificially. Despite this being even more mana inefficient. How did you come up with this? Nelly asked in awe after they finished their lesson. She had managed to not ask this exact question in their first or second lessons as she was in shock with the new application, but now she couldn't hold herself back. Unlike chanting mages, I can use two different mana types at the same time. Ajax answered as he called lightning mana in his left hand and metal mana in his right. Rune mages can do that as well. Nelly countered. True, but rune magic has little to no time for intent to be imparted, not only that the rune's rigidity would mean the resulting mana type would be rigid and brittle. Ajax said. I'm sure magnetic mana had been noticed before. However, it would most likely have happened when users of metal and lightning mana fought each other. As Ajax walked towards the academy, he was resolute in his decision to share magnetic mana. His recreation of a battery, however, was something Ajax would keep to himself. The creation of consistent current wouldn't be all that big of a discovery in this world, with mana taking the role as society's main source of fuel it would do little in terms of inventions. What it would do, however, is allow others to recreate the same experiment that Ajax hoped to use later on to learn about space and whatever that other mana type was, and that he did not want to share just yet. The school day passed quickly as Ajax focused on his studies, leaving the new topic for after they were all finished with their training. One thing that did stick out to him was that Anna seemed to be a little nervous about something. She was maintaining her composure well, Ajax doubted anyone else had noticed, but whatever it was seemed to concern him as well from the way she kept stealing glances at him. Ajax, a word? Anna asked once they were dismissed from their physical training. Sure, but is it sensitive? Ajax asked. Not very, why? Anna confirmed. Could we talk as we make our way to the headmaster, there is something I want to talk to him about. Ajax answered. When it came to a new mana type, the headmaster would be the most interested as he could then attempt to create chance for it with his legendary skill, especially so since this mana type wasn't all that violent. Grandpa? Lexi, who had been with Anna quickly perked up. Of course we'll join you. My father has finished the negotiations with the Empire Anna began when they started making their way up the stairs. I'm sorry to hear about your... Incident with some Empire spies the other day, but it seems that gave him quite a bit of leverage in the negotiation. Both Ajax and Lexi twitched a little at the awkwardness that rose as Anna mentioned the incident. Well, at least somebody got something good out of that. Ajax said, unaware that the king had already squeezed quite a bit of information out of the captured spies. It seems like the Empire is also very interested in what you can do. Anna continued. They were adamant on the conditions they outlined for their main dungeon, this rigidity let Dad push for a lot more. Oh? Ajax perked up a bit at this. How much of this am I getting, he asked, unable to keep the greed from his voice. Don't drool now. Lexi teased as she picked up on it. You get will get exactly what I outlined last time. Anna said, and Ajax frowned as he was expecting he would get at least a taste of these unexpected extras. The only change is that the team delving their main dungeon will get two delves. What does that matter? Lexi asked while Ajax processed the information. So what if he can delve it two times, if he can't take a booster with him the second time it's going to be almost the same thing as only going once? Ajax's thoughts went in the same direction as Lexi's, but one idea stood out to him that would make the second delve a lot more valuable. When? The single word was all that Ajax said. The first delve is going to be three months from now, we'll leave for the Empire in one month. Anna said. The second will be in six years. There it was. 
Just like Ajax thought he was going to get a chance to collect the extra stats from a lot more floors than he had expected. It was such a good deal that Ajax berated himself for the moment of doubt and ungratefulness he had felt towards the Goldmancer Patriarch moments before when Anna said he would only get Delve slots. Dad tried to get the second Delve in 20 years, but it seems the Empire wants to take a look at what you can do after they see you in action in the tournament as well. Anna quickly tried to explain when she interpreted Ajax's silence as displeasure with the timeline. Ajax was actually ecstatic with the six-year timeline, a twenty-year timeline would have actually been detrimental to him. The reason for this was simple, access to the dungeon became extremely limited as one got higher in level. Considering his leveling speed Ajax thought he would be able to reach level 80, maybe 85, in twenty years so long as things went his way. At that point, considering his stats after all of the extra floors he would be able to clear in his two delves in the Empire now and the delve in the Republic, it wouldn't be a surprise for the Empire to break the agreement justify it by claiming that allowing him to delve could pose a serious security threat to the capital. That's a great deal. Ajax said with a smile, one that brought a wave of relief for Anna. You're done right? Lexi asked as they all stopped in front of the headmaster's door. At their nod, Lexi simply burst into the room without even a short knock. Grandpa, how are you? Did you miss me? Ajax could swear he could see the vein on the headmaster's forehead pulsing before he let out a long sigh and calmed down. How many times have I asked you to at least knock once before you open the door? With his perception Ajax managed to make out a long line that cut across the parchment in front of the headmaster and even continued off the paper and onto the desk, not only that, but its starting point was from the last word written on the page. Yes grandpa, sorry grandpa. Despite the words it was clear to all that Lexi was only pretending to be chastised. Ajax said he had something he wanted to discuss with you. Oh, what is it? the headmaster asked. It'll cost you a coin. Ajax said with a small smirk as he had practiced the unveiling of his new mana type. The headmaster raised an intrigue eyebrow, but nevertheless pulled out a large gold silver coin. Once the coin was in his hand Ajax released a strong pulse of magnetic mana from his own hand and towards the coin making it jump from the headmaster's palm towards his own. While his trick worked perfectly on the coin, Ajax hadn't expected that the large candle stand that was pulled off balance was also falling towards him now. Ajax's reflexes were quick enough that he managed to catch the candle stand without making a mess in the office, and he quickly apologized. Sorry about that, I'm still getting used to using it. The headmaster was staring wide-eyed at him as he fumbled to stabilize the candle stand. Forget the candle stand, what was that? The calm and composed voice was gone and in its place was one that reminded Ajax of the old librarian when they were experimenting with cursed mana. Chapter 272 What is going on here? Balthazar had made his way into the room before Ajax had a chance to answer the headmaster's question. I felt some weird mana coming out of here, I thought you knew better than to experiment on the premises, mana shaper, let alone with students nearby. That wasn't me. Mana Shaper waved the former headmaster of the academy off, without taking his eyes off Ajax. More importantly I have no idea what that was, I am hoping you are willing to share something regarding it and aren't just here to show off. Despite the annoyed sounding words, the headmaster's tone still gave away his excitement. You didn't bring this to me? Balthazar asked, a little taken aback, by the development. It wasn't a good fit for you. Ajax said. Not only that, but what is needed for this is advanced magic theory. And what do you think I can provide? Balthazar sounded a little offended. You have a vast experience but for anything that isn't based off of vitality, you simply don't have the stats to match up to that experience. Ajax said honestly. You are who I would go to if I was ever starting the first few steps into a known field, like I did with curses. You have the experience and the skill to help a novice, but this requires more advanced knowledge. At this Ajax lightly tossed the coin towards Balthazar, before releasing two more light bursts of magnetic mana, the first stopped the forward momentum of the coin and the second drew it through a back towards his palm. This time he made sure to keep a good hold on the candle stand so that it wouldn't fall. 
If this is something that can be researched beyond just my ability to use, I would have invited you as well. Ajax reassured the old librarian. What do you mean, beyond just your ability to use? Lexi asked. What even is that? I never felt that kind of mana before. It's called, magnetic mana. Ajax said, the odd looks he was given at that let him know he should add some context. It's what the affinity skill called it anyway. A new mana type, the headmaster muttered his eyes wide. That great where did you find it? Was it from a monster inside the dungeon? Did he use chants, or maybe runes? Please tell me it was humanoid. Ajax was quickly overwhelmed by the barrage of questions, but he did his best to answer them. Yes, it's a new mana type. No, it wasn't from the dungeon. It was a humanoid. And the chance and runes question is why I came to you. Where did you find a humanoid monster that has this kind of magic outside the dungeon? Both Balthazar and Mana Shaper dropped their curiosity in the new mana type and focused on the possible threat to the kingdom. I never said it was a monster. Ajax shot back. What? Mana Shaper looked confused. Then how? Ajax let out a long sigh and conjured metal mana in his right hand and lightning mana in his left. When he put his hands together a pulse of magnetic mana, stronger than any before was released and a number of metal pieces around the office fell off their shelves. This is another reason I didn't bring this to you. Ajax said as he looked towards Balthazar. I remember you saying that you don't have lightning mana affinity. A weird interaction, the headmaster said as he looked at the objects that fell around his office. Only metallic objects were affected yet not all of them equally, proximity seems to be a factor but it's not the only one. As far as I can tell there are three factors that determine how reactive a metal is to this mana. Ajax said. Distance, the metal itself and how much mana it contains. What is the best metal you found and which one is the worst, the headmaster asked. Iron is the best and gold is the worst, the higher the mana infused in the metal the more powerful the attraction. Ajax said. I didn't do all that many tests with highly concentrated mana. That's why you're coming out with it. Anna spoke for the first time since Ajax revealed the new mana type. It's not just for the recognition and for their expertise, you need funding to really look into it. Ajax chose not to say anything to that. Sure, he had a few other reasons, but he couldn't disclose those without also hinting at his void affinity that he was hoping to keep truly secret. Well you certainly made the right decision coming to me, the headmaster said as he nodded at Anna's reasoning. With the absence of runes or chance others might not be so willing to sink too much money into it. But Duke Young is right, this is not the right place to look into this. At that the headmaster covered his mouth, and all Ajax, and everyone else could hear, was the muffled whisper of what had to be a long cast. A short minute later Ajax saw a clone of the headmaster appear next to him and this time it was his turn to be shocked. There now we can go, the headmaster started to herd everyone out of his office. How did you do that? Ajax asked as they were all leaving. I am sorry to say that it isn't as impressive as it may look, the headmaster said. That is a combination of illusion magic, with a little life magic, to give it some sentience. The projection isn't capable of exerting more force than a person with twenty in their physical stats, not only that but it is also bound to the room and unable to leave until the mana eventually runs out and it will disappear. Without the affinity for life magic that clone won't have the mental faculties to do anything more than tidy up the office and maybe grade some multiple choice tests or such boring activities. Balthazar also jumped in. That extra information flipped Ajax's entire thought process when it came to life mana. Previously he had thought the mana type was lifestyle-focused one as it came with the ability to create and raise crops, but with the idea of granting even basic and temporary sentience to a construct, he realized that it truly did deserve its legendary rating. From there, the odd group of five made their way to a secluded area where they could more thoroughly test the new mana type. Unfortunately, despite testing the mana type until Ajax was almost out of mana, they had made little progress in terms of anything besides some more concrete numbers on its effectiveness. You're definitely right. 
the headmaster said at the end. This mana type will definitely prove to be a mage's go-to spell when dealing with a surprise assassin, since we usually wear so little to no metal at all. Unfortunately, it will be useless until we can learn a few chants for it. I think there is a way it could be useful now? Ajax pressed. Sometimes I forget just how young you are, the headmaster said with a laugh that the old librarian shared. It's when your impatience like that shows up that reassures me of your age. Sure, you can use the mana type by combining metal and lightning mana, but unlike you other mages can't cast two spells at the same time. If there is only one mage, sure. Ajax admitted. But what if there are two mages? I remember Lexi and Anna combining their air and fire magic back during the mock war, since the two mana types react so well together wouldn't it just take both of them being put together for it to appear? I thought that this would actually be easier since magnetic mana is much more stable than a combination of air and fire. The laughter of the two dukes died off at that, not only that, but both Anna and Lexi perked up and came close from the edges of the room where they stood to watch the testing. We can try it. Lexi said with excitement. I think some more testing would be best before we try something like that, the duke's concern for his granddaughter showed up. Well there won't be any more from Ajax, he's run through his mana reserves. Anna said. Besides we know that magnetic mana isn't harmful, so as long as we start off with a small amount we should be fine. It took a few more minutes before Lexi and Anna were able to convince the headmaster that letting them try wouldn't be dangerous. The girls did make a few mistakes when they first tried generating the mana, the main issue they had was that they generated too much lightning mana and not enough metal resulting in stray small bolts striking them after they generated the mana. Chapter 273 Mana Shaper, POV What sort of monster is this kid? I can't help but ask myself as I look at him sitting on the sidelines, drawing in deep breaths. Balthazar is helping Lexi and Anna with the safety precautions, before they try their hand at the new mana type so I can focus on Ajax. I knew that he had an odd and possibly new mana type at his disposal. I couldn't do much with the knowledge since my silence on the matter was part of the favor that I owed to House Silvertongue and they asked me about something he managed to pull up during one of their delves, but this magnetic mana as he calls it seems nothing like what they described. So the question is were they lying to me and trying to throw me off the scent? That theory makes no sense, why would they do something like that only for him to come to me like this? There is of course a second option, one that seems just as unlikely, but that is only if common sense is applied. What if he gained two new affinities that haven't been explored by humanoids? I know exactly how difficult something like that is to pull off. After all I managed it once myself, though my achievement was arguably harder to succeed in, cold flames were still just a rare affinity. Managing to keep the easy generation and spread of fire with the cold attribute of ice proved to be a true headache, and even then I only achieved it after the inspiration I gained from an elemental floor boss with the attribute. What is even more ingenious, the perfect defense against this magnetic mana is clear, simply were nothing metallic. Besides that, however, the next best thing is to bring up a strong defense the moment you are hit by it. That would be too extreme a weakness for anyone to pick this up as anything more than a last-ditch option. From what the Silver Tongues told me, however, he has a way to bypass defenses with his other affinity. By revealing this one to the world he is setting up the perfect trap for all who would go after him directly. Are you girls ready? I hear Balthazar ask and I refocus on them. How much mana should we put into it? Lexi asks. Let's start small. I say. See if you can generate together only 10 mana each. The outcome isn't ideal, but it is a success. While they did succeed in generating magnetic mana, the use of two people clearly shows the issue with approach, 10 mana from each did not generate an equal amount of the affinity mana, and a bit of Anna's leftover lightning mana shocked Lexi. Al, Lexi exclaimed. Well at least it worked, kind of. You definitely got it. Ajax said. You just need a bit of practice to ensure you are each outputting the same amount of attuned mana and not initial mana. The small tests go off without anything else of note, a few more shocks here and there, but nothing all that big. 
Where the first big difference happens is when the girls start putting in a lot more mana. I'll put in 300. Anna says. I'll do 400 then, just to be safe. Lexi nodded. The result there was surprising to say the least. Despite a few bits of metallic mana being wasted by the wayside, I suspect they put about 670 mana into that combination. Unlike any of Ajax's previous demonstrations, however, this is a lot stronger of a release. The most Ajax ever put in was 300 mana, but the power is more than double in size, close to five times as strong. Whereas, that preview managed to pull the training weapons off the rack, this sent all of the flying towards the girls at high speed. Ram Seuss, I mutter, as I spawn a wind wall blocking all of the weapons. Does it scale that well with more mana? Balthazar asks after everyone stays staring at the pile of weapons now on the ground. It's not so much a matter of scale. Ajax says. They used a bit more than double the amount of mana you did, but the effect is four times as strong, how do you explain it, he asked, but I already knew the answer there. That's the downside of your casting style, I said. Isn't it? You get the flexibility, speed, even multicasting. But you sacrifice power. Ajax simply let out a sigh as he nodded in confirmation. Despite the massive upsides, there are also strong downsides. If the king's oldest son is to be believed those downsides also extend to limiting the caster to only using mana types they received an affinity skill towards. If that is true, however, the difficulty and compatibility will mean that his leveling pace will slow down much slower, he might even manage to keep a three-level-a-year average for the next decade. Since you came to me with this so openly, I am guessing you are willing to share it beyond just the two of us? I ask. Sharing this is just me being through. The kid surprises me once again. I mean I obviously want to add this mana type to my abilities, but the way I discovered it is something that I will not only keep the whole credit for, but also something the king may want to keep more tightly controlled. The way you discovered it? Balthazar asks. I know I'm not always a model of efficiency when training, but not even I spent my time randomly mixing my mana types to see what would happen. Ajax says this is clearly related to their previous work together on curses. Knowing how much the old man cares about efficiency, I can see why someone so young would take a chance to fire back. So then how did you come up with it? Lexi asks. I was training, after the latest incident, I focused on something that seemed to work particularly well and came upon the odd interaction. Ajax said. Do you have a full set of armor here that is made out of mana-enhanced metal? I do, but it's not all that high of a mana concentration. I answer. That's perfect, I wouldn't want to use an expensive one for this anyway. Ajax says, and that has me more interested. After, I bring out the suit Ajax, quickly puts it on one of the target mannequins. Go ahead and use a lightning strike on it. I do as he says. Even without putting all that much mana into the strike, I still knock the helmet off with a precise blow. This clearly surprises Ajax, and it was obviously not what he expected me to do. Can you do a more prolonged spell with the intent to immobilize instead of strike down, he says after he puts the helmet back in place. I see why he was surprised now, for him lightning is much more of a control affinity than one used for pure power. The effect of lightning on muscles is one that is well known and used when dealing with large creatures, though mages prefer the penetrating power it offers in conflicts with other humanoids. Nevertheless, I do as he says. I still don't see what you mean. I say following my second use of lightning mana. You will now, he says after he takes a fully metal mace and places both hands of the mannequin on it. Hit it again. I do so again, but this time something is different. Unlike my previous attack, I actively shift away from my intended pattern. Instead of radiating outward from the point of impact, the lightning mana travels in repeated circles through the armor and the metal warhammer. Not only that, but I can also feel the release of magnetic mana. A very interesting phenomenon, with this mages would just need to carry a piece of mana-infused metal and they can simply strike it with lightning mana to achieve the desired effect. Though I can't help but feel there is too much magnetic mana being released from the small lightning I sent. 
That sure is a more convenient way of generating it than training two mages to cast in sync at a moment's notice. Balthazar says. But I don't see why the king would care about keeping it hidden. It takes both metal and lightning mana to generate magnetic mana. Ajax says, and I get a bad feeling. If we are getting it from here, despite only casting lightning, where does the metal one come from? I'm the first one to catch on as I focus my, sense mana, on the suit of armor. Just as I feared, the density of the mana is lower now. Not only that, but I'm not the only one to catch on. You're taking it from the mana infused in the metal. Lexi exclaims, she was always a quick study. The king will definitely want to keep this quiet. I say. A way to weaken any pieces of equipment that contain mana-infused metal, with proper precautions and good timing in place this could be used to turn a war on its head. I know for a fact, the king will have me researching this as well as a way to stop it from being used against us the moment he hears about it. Chapter 274 Following Ajax's revelation and with a clear example in front of them about the truth of his allegations, both the headmaster and the librarian quickly started walking the three students away from the secure training grounds and towards the royal castle. Neither of the older men were acting in their capacity as faculty, however, both had taken out a clear sigil of their house, placed it visibly on their chest. They were now being escorted by Duke Manashaper and Duke Young. More than that Duke Manashap replaced a powerful illusion over them before they even made it out of the training grounds. What is going on? Ajax asked. Something you should have learned in your fourth year. Duke Young said. We're going to be informing the king of this discovery, right now. Duke Manashaper said. This is too big. Anna explained for him and Lexi. The ability to wear down armor like that is already powerful enough in a war setting, but there it is even more terrifying in a revolt. You will all be made aware of this in your fourth year, it is one of the more undisclosed rules that the kingdom has. Balthazar said. What it boils down to is that no more than two houses can share access to a specific technique or skill, while also maintaining it as a secret. It is there so that the royal family doesn't change with every new discovery of a powerful trick. A few large noble houses would share it and then they would start a revolt. Duke Manashaper chimed in. Even if we were to overlook House Hearthbound as a new baron house, we already have two ducal houses and one of the three archdukes. Balthazar said. It is usually the first lesson taught in the fourth year of the academy since around that time is when most prodigies hit level 35 and start experimenting with creating their own style and niche skills. Everyone threw Ajax a look at that. Funnily enough he hadn't broken the mold there as he was around level 35 now that the innovation started, he simply did it a whole two years early. As they made their way through the city Ajax had plenty of time to get a good look at the illusion magic used by Duke Manashaper. He was sad to admit that it wasn't the best he'd ever seen, that honor went to the kit soon, but this was a solid second place. Despite not being the target of the illusion and spending the entire trip towards the castle, looking at it, he couldn't find any weak point in it. His only answer to it would be to simply brute force it with, mana siphon. Halt, the palace guards called out once Duke Manashaper removed the illusion surrounding them. The five of them stopped, none of them said a word but Duke Young threw an obvious look behind them before turning to glare at the guards. You may wait inside, but don't approach the second gate, before one of the squads comes to get you, the guard said after a few seconds. It took no longer than five minutes before one of the squads Ajax didn't know opened the second gate and made their way towards them, all of them were in their combat gear and had stern looks on their faces. The gear they had on marked them as the fifth. In contrast to them the king's oldest son was sporting a cheeky grin as he made his way towards the group of five. Well this was rather unexpected. What good thing have you found out? Oddly enough, despite never having met him, before the prince was talking to Ajax. How did you? Ajax trailed off at that. One of the people we had protectively tailing you reported in about your meeting, the prince said. You then show up right here under an illusion, clearly you found something good and shared it. The only question I have is if you didn't know the implication of what you found or if you had a few questions you wanted to ask them about it. He had questions. 
Balthazar replied with a wide grin. It may have taken a while, but I think I finally found a student that's more of a problem child than you. What? The prince said, with clearly faked outrage. You've always been an old man, but I think it's finally starting to catch up to you. Nobody is more of a problem than me. Anna, Lexi, and Ajax all stared in shock at the prince, while Duke Manashaper who was clearly experienced in dealing with the prince and his eccentricities was simply rubbing his forehead in an attempt to prevent the oncoming headache. We have something that needs to be brought to the king's attention. Duke Manashaper said. Follow us, the king has granted you a private audience, the leader of the fifth said, he was just as eager to get past the initial stages of this interaction where a bit of suspicion had to be maintained. All of them walked in a heavy silence as they made their way towards the throne room. Or at least most of them did, the seriousness of the situation was heavily undermined by the prince and Balthazar catching up with each other, completely ignoring the situation at hand. I was right, the prince declared the moment he set foot in the throne room. He simply had questions. None of us disagreed with you, the crown prince said as he looked to be having a much tougher time fighting off the same headache that Duke Manashaper was combating. The audience for this meeting was both larger and at the same time, smaller than the previous time Ajax had come to report to the king. Whereas previously there were three full squads in attendance, this time it was only the fifth and the leader of the first. Besides them and the king all three of the king's children, the queen, Xavier, and the king's only granddaughter, were all in attendance. I take it that this is something different than last time, Ajax? the king asked. It was Balthazar, Anna, Lexi, and Duke Manashaper who were surprised at that question. They all understood that Ajax had to have shared something with the king that he was looking to keep secret. Yes. Ajax confirmed. Why not bring it to us first, the leader of the first squad asked. The main research is still far from ready to be applied. Duke Manashaper answered. Ajax came to me with questions that I know will at least take years for me to find answers to. Then why did you rush here, the king asked. One of the steps involved in the discovery has more immediate and more serious consequences, the duke answered. Ajax himself already refused to share more than a basic demonstration with me before you were informed of it and even that was to answer an obvious question regarding his discovery. From there, the duke went on to explain in detail everything he had learned in the past few hours about magnetic mana. Its applications, its strengths, its weaknesses as well as the most obvious uses. They even had Ajax show them examples of it both being directly created as well as fused from metal and lightning. Lexi and Anna both did their part too in showing how it could be used by two mages even without the affinity in question. Without any known runes or chants, this mana affinity currently has little potential to be developed. What we know so far has provided me with a clear path for testing. In a few years, I hope to develop at least one chant that successfully implements it, the Duke finished. Certainly noteworthy, and I can see why you are the one he would approach with this, the king nodded. I don't see the immediate and dire impact, however. It was then that Duke Manashaper explained the process that Ajax claimed led to him discovering the existence of magnetic mana. The air in the room turned instantly shifted once he was done explaining the previous congratulatory and somewhat relaxed mood was now serious and focused. What effects can this have on mana-infused metals that are already sporting runic magic, the prince asked. For the first time since meeting them at the gate, he had lost his cheery attitude and looked on edge. I don't know, the duke admitted. Other than the most basic of requirements for the magnetic mana generation to occur, I have done no testing. With two ducal families, as well as one of the three archduke, we thought it prudent that the royal family be informed. Balthazar said. You have done well, the crown prince said. This is indeed something that must be considered carefully. Duke Manashaper if I could ask that you focus your research on this primarily for at least the next few months so that we can get a foundational understanding. Yes, your highness, the duke responded. With everything explained Ajax took the opportunity to change the subject, everyone was too on edge with the previous revelation, but there was nothing they could about it before more testing was done. Your Majesty, about your request to me. 
Yes, the king appreciated the change in subject. Would it be possible for me to have access to a few attempts at solo delving before the trip to the empire? I would like to at least be prepared so that I can reach as high a floor as possible. Ajax requested. Yes, that is a reasonable request, the king nodded. I must insist, however, that you have someone escorting you while you do so, I do not want to see you kill yourself over this, the king said. Ah, uh, Ajax found himself speechless at that since he didn't have anyone that was strong enough to act as minder for him. I'll go with him, the king's firstborn, having regained his cheery attitude with the change in subject was quick to involve himself in the discussion. We can head out tomorrow. Chapter 275 While all of the strong people in the room had a very good poker face, the same thing could not be said for the royal family's younger generation. Besides Xavier's jealous glance towards Ajax the king's granddaughter was also looking shocked at the statement. Why you? Duke Manishaper asked. You're going to be busy looking into this new potential discovery, not to mention that so long as he wears a little bit of a disguise before he enters the dungeon nobody will question it and they will just play it off as one of my whims, the king's oldest son said. Besides, I also want to see what he can do in the dungeon. Ha, huh, the crown prince let out a deep sigh. In terms of power and cover, he is indeed the best candidate to let you have your training without anyone else finding out. Also one of the best to analyze anything I might have kept to myself. Ajax responded. I am fine with signing a contract about no revealing anything I find out about you, the excited prince continued. And what happens if you break it? Anna asked, knowing full well that there anything he might guarantee that might harm him could be counteracted by a good enough skill. His family gets a hundred million gold coins, the prince said offhandedly. Ak Ajax choked when he heard the number. Not even a decade ago Ajax had become the richest person in the village he grew up in because he had received a hundred gold coins, a hundred million would be enough to rocket his family into contention for the title of Archduke Goldmancer. Monetary deals are the best to make. Anna murmured. No skill will let him skip out on the tab. So it's settled then, the prince clapped his hands. I'll come get you in two days. Underscore 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 Two days later Ajax found himself standing in queue for the dungeon alongside the king's oldest son. Even with a few days to discuss this with his family, he hadn't managed to find a better option. The sole limitation that Ajax put on himself for this delve was that he was going to be keeping Void Mana concealed no matter what happened. The plan was for him to delve all the way to the sixth floor of the dungeon and no further. Despite having delved even as deep as the eighth floor as part of a team, solo delving was a lot more risky and required different skills. Finally, Ajax said as they entered the dungeon and he removed the mask from his head. This thing is so stuffy. It might be but with the enchantments it carries it made sure that nobody got a read on you, the prince said as he also changed from his common clothing to his battle gear. It was now Ajax's turn to be shocked. The prince's gear easily ranked as some of the best gear he had ever seen. The only ones that could compete with it was the one he saw some of the royal squad members wearing. Even then the prince's gear was completely different from the others he had seen due to the numerous runes that were etched on every open surface of the armor. First time seeing a good runic set, the prince asked. Ajax didn't open his mouth to respond and simply nodded his head. Well don't look too impressed two-third of the runes you are seeing are illusions, and even the rest are a little distorted to all senses. Ajax knew the reason why that was, much like how chanting mages made sure to muffle and cover their mouth when chanting runic mages did much the same thing with illusion magic to protect their runes from being copied. 
Well, go on then, the prince said. The first few floors will be a snooze fest anyway. Ajax was quick to prove the prince correct as he easily cleared the way to the closest arch he could feel and then simply overwhelmed the boss guarding it. The same scene also played out on the second, third, and fourth floors. Ajax did make sure to get accurate readings on the arches he chose, he even ended up clearing four different arches on the fourth floor before he got to one that he felt good about. His ability to at least somewhat narrow down what type of floor he will be facing next will be one of the key abilities he will rely on to ensure that the floor he wants to fully clear out won't be something that would counter him. The quick dispatching of monsters and bosses ground to a halt in a very fast manner once Ajax got to the fifth floor. Even with the monsters only being level 50 at most, he now found himself on the other side of the numbers game. Whereas on his previous delves a group of 15 to 20 people took on each pack of monsters, he was facing similar odds against him from those very same small packs. Wow, so you really can keep on sucking up mana from the air without even getting tired. The prince let out a low whistle once the fight Ajax was having with an ogre patrol group ended. You are definitely going to be a menace when delving the dungeon as it naturally provides you with denser and denser mana at each floor. Well at least so long as you don't hit a mana drought floor. No adventurer in their right mind like drought floors. While all of the books Ajax had read on the subject had reinforced that the drought floor challenge effect didn't mix with other environmental challenges that was only true for the lower floors. One thing that all drought floors did have in common, however was the fact that the monsters spawned there would have at least one adept mana-consuming ability so that they could keep a hold of their mana. Ajax was glad for the praise and gave a shallow nod at the compliment while he caught his breath slash this next floor will be the one I clear out. You're going up another floor, despite the questioning structures the prince's tone made it clear that not only was he not against the idea but that he was a strong supporter. Ajax took his time on the fifth floor hunting for a suitable archway. He made sure to play it off as a luck-based skill to the prince, that turned out to be a splendid idea as the prince himself had a luck skill, and it was one he relied on whenever he went delving in deeper floors to pick a good floor theme. A forest, the prince asked as he took in his surroundings, once they got to the sixth floor. Forests are my best biomes. Ajax said with confidence. Oh how come, the prince asked. I spent five years training to be a hunter and an adventurer in a forest, before my leveling speed really picked up. Ajax shared. Besides the much stronger density of mana in the air, the forest seemed exceedingly normal, to Ajax, as he started exploring it. That is until he almost bumped into a eight-foot-tall hairy bipedal monster that seemed to resemble some descriptions of Bigfoot from back on Earth. Unlike on Earth, however, this specimen wasn't a solitary one, but instead traveled in packs of five. Oddly enough the forest was dense enough that the space between trees was small enough to give the large monster issues, when maneuvering. Ajax took full advantage of this as he quickly made short work of two of them. His sword and hammer were finding their mark and easily made it past the thick protective layer of fur they had. Or is that just thicker body hair? Despite their apparent intelligence, the remaining three big foots didn't try to escape and instead focused on attacking Ajax. Their plan was quickly foiled as Ajax used his ice mana to no only slow them down with the cold, but to create a very slippery surface on the ground resulting in the monsters not able to keep their footing while also attacking him. Once there was only one monster left, the survivor decided he had seen enough and tried to make a run for it. Unfortunately for him, he followed his instincts to get away from Ajax as quickly as possible. Even with the tight spacing of the trees, this meant that he had taken off in a straightish line away from him. This made landing a headshot with an arrow almost too easy for Ajax. That wasn't so bad, the prince said as he inspected the bodies Ajax left in his wake. They don't really have the agility needed to fight you in a place like this. Let's hope that there is something interesting for you to fight on this floor. A -a -a -u 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 -o -o -o. Growling, Aou Ajax didn't get a chance to respond as a strong howling and growling filled the air. More than that Ajax could tell that this howl didn't come from a wolf and that was making him second guess his life's choices. No need to look so scared, the prince waved him off. These are Wendigos, not a werewolf boss. 
Ajax did let out a sigh of relief at that reassurance, he still remembered well the power that the Kitson had wielded and didn't want to end up facing another floor boss just yet. With that he swapped out his sword for his axe as he prepared to engage with the cannibalistic creatures.